Hi, Carol. I'm so happy to have you on the Arthritis Life podcast. Welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be had. Yay. Can you start off by just telling the audience a little bit about your relationship to arthritis? Sure. Um, I was diagnosed at 13. Uh, they called it juvenile rheumatoid arthritis back then, or JRA for short. Um, and I had a had a pretty bumpy uh, beginning with with my relationship with arthritis and the doctors, and my family was a bit of a mess, so I didn't get a lot of support. So it was a pretty pretty bumpy start. And then um, when I was 21 was really sort of when I crossed a threshold in, in my mind from someone with a chronic illness to identifying as disabled. And it was actually a positive thing for me in a lot of ways. And it's when I first met a doctor with whom I really had a partnership. And I've had a lot of joint replacement surgery since. I, I live independently. I live across the country from my family of origin. I have a big, full, beautiful life and arthritis is ever present in it in many frustrating ways and some just water to the fish ways, but it's, there's no separating me from uh, my arthritis or my disability. Wow. Yeah. There's so much to, to unpack there, but I love how you talked about, like, I think a lot of people think that they have to like eliminate or like annihilate or beat their arthritis in order to have a full and meaningful life. And you're proof that that's not necessarily the case, right? And I've had a particularly bad time, you know, bad luck with arthritis, mm-hmm. even one of my, my doctor who I, you know, I first formed that relationship with, who's now my friend. Um, he said, you know, of all my patients, like you've, you've gotten a lot of bad breaks. And, um, and some of that, this is my kitty in back of me. I don't, I'm not growing a black furry lump from my back. <laughs> some of that, you know, I didn't take the best care of myself and my body. Um, but some of it was just luck of the draw. And, um, you know, had 12 hip replacements and, and both knees replaced. So. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I, I, I already have been wanting to do a separate episode all focus on like, what's it like to get a joint replacement? So I'm like, Oh, I'm going to keep you in mind for that one. But you know what, actually I'm going to move, move on to the book first. Yes. And then, cause I, we, there's so much I want to explore in the book, but I want, I'm definitely going to circle back to the idea of kind of accepting and embracing your identity as some, a disabled person, because that's something that not a lot of people, um, maybe have thought about or, or understand. So, but for, so I, I'm curious, like what inspired you to write your book cursed and can, maybe, I guess, can you, two questions, can you also just give the audience a little bit of a synopsis of what it's yes. about? Um, so Cursed is a young adult novel that is, that's a novel, but it's drawn from my experience of being diagnosed and really not handling it well. Um, and it was published by Charles Bridge Teen in 2019. And it went on to win the Schneider Family Book Award, uh, which is a, a, an award the American Library Association celebrates the artistic expression of the disability experience. Um, and that was like, that was the award I wanted to win and I didn't think I would do it and, and I ended up winning it. So it is uh, funny, frank and full of F-bombs. Um, cursing is is a big theme in it. And it was um, my way of sort of presenting an experience closer to mine uh, rather than sort of inspirational and someone with a whole lot of support and, and that, that kind of trajectory, which people have and my hats off to them and, and God bless them. That wasn't my experience. And I knew that there were, there were kids out there, whether they were dealing with a chronic illness or anything else where they just didn't handle it well. <laughs> so I wanted to, to let those kids know you are not alone. Um, and the, the reason wh- how I came about to write Cursed is um, I had a screenwriting mentor in the 90s as I came out here to Los Angeles from Philadelphia um, to go to the American Film Institute and I was going to work in film and TV and I was writing and I had a mentor, this mentor, Holly Goldberg Sloan, who's a writer, director, and now an award-winning children's book author. And we were getting to know each other and I told her about my background of, of getting sick at 13 and she said, wow, that's, that's really interesting. You should write about that. And, you know, I was a little hesitant on a, on a few fronts. There is sort of like, I don't want to be the disabled writer writing about disability. Um, but more so, I was really focused on another project. And I didn't, most of what I had seen and read was sort of the inspiration porn type stories. Um, and I certainly didn't want to write that. That was not, you know, my experience at all. So I thought, well, if I'm ever going to do it, it would be this 
you know, messy, foul mouthed, you know, angry girl. Um, so I let it percolate on a back burner for quite a while. And I was in a writing workshop and did a little writing exercise, which was as simple as pick an age and free write as yourself at that age. And I picked 13 and out Erica came. And then I was like, oh, I think I, I think I have the entry into this book. Um, and it was really hard to write. It took me a long, long time, but that's sort of the, the origins of the story. I, I love that so much. And all, you know, those in the audience who've, who've listened to me talk before know that I definitely have in the past tried to put myself in this box of like the inspirational person or like the A student, or I want to be like the best patient the doctors ever had and have like get gold stars. And I have, as I've gotten older, you know, learned to embrace like the messy sides, you know, and be like, it, give myself permission to curse and give myself permission to be like, this is not fair. This sucks sometimes. Yeah. My, my, if there's any message to you, to anyone newly diagnosed with a, with a painful chronic illness is that if you're angry and terrified and feel a little sorry for yourself, that is a reasonable human reaction to what you're going through. Like I would never recommend that you curl up in a fetal position and cry yourself for the rest of your life. Obviously it's not going to be a very fulfilling life, but um, you're having a reasonable reaction. This is tough. This is hard. And in my experience, it was particularly difficult like the first year. And when you're 13, the last thing you want is some old lady disease that people don't understand and to be bodily different than everyone else in your class. So it was dark period. I, I truly can't. I mean, I can imagine it enough to be terrified at what it must have felt like. Um, yeah, kids are just brutal. You know, they're just they're brutal to each other. They're brutal to themselves, you know, especially teens. So I think that you in that, that complexity in, in the book, I mean, there's so much. I'm not a book critic. I mean, in my head, I am every time I read a book. I'm like, here's my great, you know, critique. But I really I truly like loved your book as an actual piece of writing. And, um, you know, I'm a John Green fan. I mean, I lo- I read some YA, but um, YA stands for young adult, by the way. I always try to define my acronyms. But I mean, the complexity of the relationship between, you know, Ricky or Erica and her parents and the relationship between her and her, the teacher and the doctors. I mean, there's just so much to unpack. I don't know if there's a question. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> telling you, I'm just like, I'm going to fangirl for a second. Can you explain to the audience who yes, might have heard of that I before? Would, I would recommend everyone listening to your podcast and everyone on the human in the human race, listen to Stella Young's TED talk called I am not your inspiration. Thank you very much. And she sort of coined that term. And um, it basically means the, the inspiration porn are the things that objectify disabled people for the benefit of able-bodied people like the, you know, the, the picture of the adorable young Paralympian and like, you have no excuse, you know, <laughs> that, that the feel good story about how, isn't it nice that they let this disabled kid take a shot at the basketball court and everybody cheered for him. Isn't that sweet? Bless his little heart, like that stuff, you know, it's just objectifies and infantilizes disabled people. And I, I'm not having it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, when I came across that phrase, I, it, it really hit home to me because I had worked um, for many years with children with, at the time it was called, you know, special education or children with special needs, which I know even now many people in the disability and disabled community don't like that phrase, like special needs. Like we're all just humans who have different needs. Yeah. Right. Um, but it made me really confront. Yeah. At times, like use the fact that you're celebrating someone else's disability as a way to make yourself feel better about yourself. And it's not really about them. It's about you, you know, it's all the things, uh, you know, I, I appreciate my life more because God forbid, I'm like this person, like that's really what's behind. So. Exactly. And then you're trivializing it. I, I was reading a review and this is a whole other huge giant can of worms. So I was reading a review of Sia's um, very much maligned movie, Music, which I read about that. I don't know too much. I can't story. I can't watch it, but it uh, <laughs> but it was about, you know, there's a lot of things wrong with it. It really trivializes the experience Great. of Say oh, hi, hi, kitty. <laughs> Cats I have are a welcome. black one and a white one, so no clothes are safe. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, you, they balance each other out, right? But yeah, like basically in that movie, um, I thought one of the the most the most important criticisms of it was that you know the the disabled person in this case, an autistic individual, was used to further the neurotypical person's growth. You know, like yeah. oh, I'm learning about the world through you instead of that's a problem in children's literature that. 
Um, I'm in a private Facebook group where we can bitch and moan as much as we want, um, where, you know, the disabled character is used as a prop. They're, they're either inspire or they, or they're a conflict or they are, are there, you know, to, to implement the, the real character's growth. Yeah. And I, you know, and children, I mean, you, you know more about children literature than I do, but I, I, my experience with children has been that they're pretty savvy about that. Like, you know, they'll start tuning it out when it, when you start saying like, today we're going to read a book about like Timmy, who was in a wheelchair, but he never gave up and we should all be like Tim. It's like, they don't like that either, like, <laughs> you know, to some degree. So yeah. yeah, the fact that you allowed, you know, the main character of Curse to be her own, again, not, not just an inspirational, like, you know, perfect model patient, but a full complex human being is so great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the other term I'm on a campaign to eliminate is differently abled. And I have a whole spiel about that. I was actually going to make a video for Nerd Camp PA, but I just was too busy this week. It's, it's just, you know, hashtag say the word. The word is disabled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And, you know, it's when I've been running my little support group, Room to Thrive, it's been interesting. I didn't plan on this happening like as my master plan, but almost every week we've ended up talking about ableism and our own internalized ableism. Yeah. And that's in my book a lot too. Yes. I was, I'm preparing a talk, which may or may not happen at this point. And I, you know, I want to introduce the idea of ableism, but I have a very short period of time. So I was like, let me just get a quick definition. And I Googled it. And literally the first definition that came up was something like prejudice in favor of able-bodied people. They erased disabled people from the definition of ableism. I, I was just like, this is so meta, right? <laughs> it was just like, oh my God, I can't believe this. So yeah, there's a lot of work to be done in that area. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There, that's a whole other, hopefully we can maybe circle back to that yeah. um, towards the end, but I, I appreciate what an advocate one, you are. One other thing is that I certainly have my own ableism, internalized ableism. I was listening to a panel of disabled TV writers. And one of them said the most profound thing, like she shared that when she was like checking out of the grocery store and it was like taking her a little bit longer. She always used to be like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to the person in back of her. And she, that's, you know, internalized ableism. She has corrected herself. And what she says now is thank you for your patience. Which I was like, yes, <laughs> yes. I need to start doing that because it's like acknowledging that yes, they've, they've been slightly in, inconvenienced and thanking them for being patient, but not apologizing for taking up space on the planet. I love that. That's one way to, to, I love it. to combat your own if you have it. Yeah, like a simple daily um, reframe or word choice switch yes. that makes a huge yeah. difference. I love yes. it. Um, one of the things I wanted to read from from your book was the definition or, of that the main character gives of uh, kind of of arthritis, which is so great. I um, mean, I think all of us who live with inflammatory forms of arthritis have at some point tried to figure out how do I explain this? The word arthritis is just not severe enough, right? To explain it. It's like minor aches and pains. That's the frame. Yeah. That, that's the phrase that we hear. The minor yeah. aches and pains of arthritis. Oh, so, okay, here, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it and then we'll have you expand on it a little bit. So, that's the key to my misery, joints. A joint is basically anywhere one bone meets another and all of my joints burn with pain, like I'm on fire. Think about the skeleton illustration again, but zoom out for the whole body view. See all those bones connected to other bones? Now imagine each of these joints ablaze with hot red flames. Yeah, now you're getting it. Plus an added bonus of my delightful disease is that I'm tired all the time. Like, can't keep my eyes open tired all the time. <laughs> I love it. And I, I just, I love that that definition. And I'm just curious, if are there any other, like, metaphors that you found useful or other ways that you've put words to the pain? Mm-hmm. Other than your entire book? <laughs> yeah, it's my entire book. Yeah, you know, the, the, the burning and the grinding is what I, what I try to use to explain, um, if somebody asks, but it's also the exhaustion. And I'm sure you've read the Spoon Theory essay. Yes. Um, it's another thing your listeners should look up. 
And it's this one who just talks about in terms of your energy and just what you can handle. Uh, if you think of it, you have an, a, a limited number of spoons. And like, if you have to get up and take a shower, that takes a, you know, a certain amount of spoons. And then you've got to run an errand and that takes spoons. And you're not left with that many spoons. So um, I had a dear, dear friend who's very spontaneous. And he would call me up and say, hey, you want to go out to a movie? And I'm just like... Oh, no, that's, it's no way. And he's like, oh, man, you know, and, he's, and I had him read that. And then if he does that, he's like, hey, how about you want to go out to dinner? And I was like, don't got the spoons. He was like, oh, OK, I get it. So so the the exhaustion and I I am a controlling person, let's be honest. Um, but part of my controlling nature is um, that I'm actively working to eliminate frustration and danger in my space. And so when I say, you know, can you please put that in the fridge with the handle facing out? I'm not just being a controlling bitch. <laughs> I'm saying that that takes a little bit of frustration and struggle off of me. It's one, it's five milliseconds fewer that I have to be on my feet and bending over. And so, so that, you know, I try to explain that. Yeah, no, I love that. I love the, um, the spoon theory is, is such a vivid metaphor for so many people and I've heard also some people resonate with the um, faulty battery charger or maybe faulty mm -hmm. battery charging cable where like your battery just doesn't charge all the way like on someone else's. Um, but but yeah, and the idea that these little tasks, I think it's just it's really hard for people who haven't lived with pain to kind of imagine how many small tasks, you know, add up. So that, that totally makes sense. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, because I hadn't experienced this too, too much. I was diagnosed at age 21, although my, my parents did. My mom accompanied me to a couple appointments because I had gotten really, really sick and kind of um, had had some really, I don't know. I just, I needed an extra set of ears. I was just so like yeah. deconditioned and just ill. I needed help. Yeah. But um, of course, and then I got accused of, you know, being like a hypochondriac and, and all that stuff. But anyway, in your, in the book, you talked about um, that, you know, you have a, a lot of examples of the complex relationships in pediatric uh, rheumatology, where you go to the appointment with your parents. So you've got like three people in the room, not just the rheumatologist and the patient, but then the, the parent too. So um, I'm going to read this little passage. So how's she doing? He asked my mom. Oh, he is the rheumatologist. He talks only to mom, never to me. Like we're at a veterinarian's office and I'm the family pet panting and wagging my tail while they decide whether the most humane thing to do would be to put me to sleep. Dr. Blechstein and mom chat away as he feels my joints and moves my body parts around, checking for changes in range of motion. Why aren't you wearing the wrist braces I prescribed? He asks next. Because they're ugly and I hate them. And I left them in my locker at school, I, I think. I shrug. It's important, he insists, clearly frustrated that I don't adhere to his every command. <laughs> um, so first of all, why is it important for the doctor to speak directly to the patient, ev even in pediatric cases? Well, um, you know, it's that, it's that idea of, of the patient herself being erased and infantilized, you know, even when it's, an, I guess when it's an infant, they got to talk to the parents. But um, I did take some liberties. Like, I don't remember my doctor at Children's Hospital being that over the top. That doctor was sort of based on an orthopedic surgeon that I've had more recently. It was just the most stuck up, like pedantic jerk. Um, but sorry. I just, you know, I really grew to learn that um, being in partnership with my doctor, either use whatever metaphor you want, whether you're on the same team or he's the coach and you're the star quarterback or you're in partnership and you're working together. Um, for me to be involved in my own recovery, um, it, it, it gives me agency and it empowers me to be a part of this situation that feels so incredibly out of control. But if I am an active participant in my treatment plan and my opinions are listened to and mattered, it, 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 you know, it lessens that blow of this completely, you know, outside thing that you, that you really don't have any control over. So that was really a huge difference for me. Um, transitioning from this, this kid was just like so pissed off at everybody and didn't, you know, just the doctor was the enemy. 
um, to somebody who was actively engaged in my own well-being. And, you know, it took until I was 21. So one of the hopes with Curse is that younger kids learn, oh, this is, I can do this and this is, is going to, I'm going to benefit from this in a, in a lot of different ways. That's so great. I mean, and, and what's, what's wonderful about that is it's not only more enjoyable as the patient, it's actually like the research shows that that's where the best outcomes come yeah. out from, um, where, you know, p- patients are actively involved in their care. And it's not just like patient centered care where yeah. it's like, oh, the patient's in the center, but like, I'm still telling them kind of what to do. It's like, that, like you mentioned, the partnership model. And, you know, it makes sense, right? Because you're living with this 24 seven. So no matter how wonderful your rheumatologist is, like one appointment every three months or two months is not going to be sufficient for you to manage this on like a minute by minute basis. You have to learn those tools. Right. And your rheumatologist really needs to hear from you of how those month, two months, three months, whatever it's been, um, how it's been going and how you've been feeling and what's been flaring and how's your exhaustion. Yeah. And something else I'm just going to mention for the record that some people don't end up learning is that, you know, the blood work is only part of the story. So, you know, the rheumatologist needs to know, even if your blood work looks good, how have you actually been feeling? Because your symptoms don't always track along with the blood work, but yeah, I found that sometimes my symptoms are behind the blood work and sometimes they're ahead of the blood work. Like, oh, your blood work looks fine. And then in the next month, like, ooh, your CRP is really elevated. So I told you, yeah. <laughs> told you I was having a flare. So yeah. totally. And I think, um, you know, this, the point about you not wearing your braces, the little wrist braces, you know, I think that's so important. I mean, I'm an occupational therapist, you know, and we're trained in the books, you know, in the textbooks. Now we are trained to be very, you know, partnered with the patients and ideally we should, but I think sometimes we get our blinders on and we're like, okay, what's the best, like, what's the best brace for the patient without remembering that they may not want to wear it. Like, (laughs) so like in your case, you know, did you, when you were younger, um, was it difficult for you to have anything like that visibly stood out, like, you know, having a brace or. Yes. I mean, all of that, when I was 13, I just wasn't, and in high school, I just wasn't having any of it. Um, and I will say that once I, you know, started working in partnership and after I had my first knee replacement and, uh, I was given wrist braces and, I came back like a few years later for a different surgery and the wrist braces were all sort of like worn in and a little dirty and the Velcro was kind of crappy and the OT was just like, Oh, this is the most beautiful thing in the world. Um, so, uh, I, you know, you, you're going to ask me later, you know, suggestions I have for, for newly diagnosed people. And I just, you know, this isn't a setup, but I always say, I swear I say this, that listen to your OA, your OT, like she is the voice of God and do everything, like do everything your OT says, because um, I didn't, I couldn't be bothered. And I have significant, significant deformities. Um, My, my uh, function and my appearance has been significantly affected. Now I'm still able to do what I need to do and everything, but, um, and like I said, I had a bad time of it. Um, so, and, and now there's the biologic. So, so people don't necessarily, um, they're not at risk of having as many deformities and loss of function as I have, but, um, it, it really makes your life easier when you have, when you retain your range of motion and the, the psychological effect of having significant deformities is, is significant, you know, and I'm just like, I'm just active in it. I, this is me. This is how I look. My friends love me. I have value. Um, but it's hard sometimes it's really, you know, I love like zoom. I can keep my hands down. You know? <laughs> um, but you know, that, that is, psychologically it's, it's, it's rough. So uh, if you listen to your OT and you practice joint preservation, you wear your wrist brace and you do your shoulder exercises, um, you greatly increase your chances of retaining your, your, the appearance of your hands and the functionality of your hands and upper body. So I swear Cheryl did not pay me to say all this. This is, I say it all the time. Oh, like, that's so your... great. No, that, yes. I mean, first of all, I'm so glad this is being recorded. I'm going to yeah. like, <laughs> I'm going to give this to all my OT friends and say, give this, you know, no, I'm just kidding. And OTs, I always consider you guys like 
kind of superheroes like Inspector Gadgets. When you get like a really good OT and you're trying to make some customized gadget that's like fits your hands and your strength and your, it's like, Ooh, what if we use this thing? Oh, I can melt this down. It's like, I love working with a good OT. Um, yeah. to, to like create stuff. Oh, I'm so, no, thank you. Thank you for saying that. We, I do. I, I definitely love highlighting the importance of occupational therapists because um, we're not or often underutilized in, in rheumatology. And I, I know part of it is that because we're in the biologics era that sometimes yeah. they, but the, the, the rheumatologists don't feel that the patients have as severe of needs, but we still, like you mentioned, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And the bo- one biologic won't necessarily work for you forever. Like I'm on my fourth biologic in 18 yeah, years. That's, that's the other thing is that they run their course. Yeah. You gotta switch up. I love, 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 love your TikTok videos. And oh. I, I admire you so much because I'm just like, she is just so out there and just like, you know, hip slick and cool. You're young, you're pretty, they're fun. You bring fun to, and there, you had one where you were showing a, a, a bathroom aid and, you know, the bathroom stuff is like the last echelon of stuff. People don't want to think about or talk about. Mm-hmm. And you did that one. And it, it was just like, so like, and this is how you use it. it you know, it was just a beat. And I was just like, Oh my God, God bless her. Like, I love your TikTok videos. Thank you. Well, and I, I think I, I am definitely like an overthinker, like I mentioned <laughs> earlier. So, um, um, like I do want to toe this line between being like, I am a happy go lucky just person. Like it's just my inborn personality. Right. It's like, um, I was a happy baby according to my parents, you know, so I'm, I'm not like faking that part of myself, but I also don't want to was a happy my- baby too. I don't know what the heck. No. <laughs> no, well, and then but the thing is, again, I've, I've put so much pressure on myself at times to, oh, only like in the past, like think yeah. positive and only look at the positive. And I didn't allow myself to like, I went to therapy as a patient, like to process, like I didn't process anything negative in my life really until then. And I, I was like given permission to, but, but anyway, on TikTok and stuff, I will get, I'll still get people saying, oh, how long have you been in remission? I'm like, oh, I haven't been in remission since I was yeah. pregnant. Like, and that was just a temporary remission, you know, yeah. that before, before then it was like 2008. So, you know, I'm just cause I'm able to, again, my disease is more well controlled than it would have been if I was diagnosed be, be, before the biologic era, but I, I have mild deformities. I don't have complete normal range of motion. Like my thumb, yeah. again, I'm not complaining. It's like, but I mean, my, my yeah. thumb, this one doesn't go down any further, yeah. my right one. And yeah. it's like, yeah. um, you know, my shoulder, I can't like do a bra with my, my right shoulder. So, you know, you, but the thing, yeah, but the, Back to your point about, yeah, like I'm trying to like, it's really funny. I just found out that Dax Shepard, famous um, yes, actor yes. and podcaster, yes. he's now like on my, um, like would love to have on the podcast list as well. He has psoriatic arthritis and um, he had a funny little discussion with Ted Danson, who also has psoriatic arthritis. And they were talking about how like arthritis is such an unsexy diagnosis. And I was like, is, yeah, yeah, accepted. I'm trying to. <laughs> well, Dax Shepard is pretty sexy. So, you know, I know Dax, <laughs> if you're listening, you yes. are invited cordially. I like that you're destigmatizing the, the disability aids. Mm, and yeah. thank God, for, like I often say, and I know you want to talk about my book, but <laughs> Oh, Let's just have to turn this into like a fan um, session for each of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You um, you know, I often say that the dumb little dressing stick, like I remember I was given my first dressing stick and the I think it was from a PT, and he was like, oh, I don't know, you, you put your pants up with it. I don't know, right? I'm like, all right, I'll take it home. And then the, when I came back again, because I like had my knee replaced in 85, and then I came back to have hip replacements in 88 with the dirty, you know, wrist braces. And they're like, oh, and I was, it came with my dressing stick and toe. And they're like, oh, you found a use for that. I was like, dude, um, I, I have dresses all around my house. I use them for so many things. Like they said, you could give us, give a workshop here at the rehab on all the multiple uses of a, of a dressing stick. And I, I consider it like my bat belt, like this is probably before your time, but there was a show in the sixties and seventies with Batman and Robin and, and uh, mm-hmm. they would be in some extreme circumstance, like they're tied where a, where a rotator saw is coming to cut, cut them in half. And Oh my gosh, they can't get out. And what will we do? And then he's like, wait, I have this gadget on my bat belt and it's the perfect <laughs> thing to get us out of this horrible mess. Um, so my dressing thing is like my bat belt. Like I use that thing for so much. 
And, you know, it's just a dumb stick with a hook on one end and a push pole on the other. And I have adapted. Some of them have a bigger hook and some of them have this. And it's, I feel like a dental hygienist. You know, I put on my shoes. I got this one for that thing. And then this one, you know. That's amazing. Dumb little invention. But it is really the difference between my being able to live independently and not. And, and so you got that from a physical therapist. First of all, thank you for sharing. But then and it sounds like you really you weren't really trained on how to use it. You just you really learned it on your own. And I had an OT when I started losing range of motion in my shoulders. It was like, well, how am I going to put on my, my a T-shirt or a sweater? And, and this is not a good example of OT. She's like, well, you know, you should just wear button up things. And I'm like, never wear a T-shirt again. Um, and I was like, well, that's unacceptable. Also, but I, they're way hard. Like, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, so I figured out a way to get my t-shirts on using a dressing steak, which is just that I, I put one arm through and then I use the push pull to push it over my head. And then I put the other arm through like, voila, I can wear sweatshirts and sweaters. <laughs> wow. That's no, we got to get you on TikTok making some of these life hack videos uh, too. Yeah, I, I, you know, one of my big pushes is to be on video more and it is hard. I did an unboxing video, which is the big rage. And my hands were so present. And I, I I did it just to get over my fear of doing it. I didn't even brush my hair for a certain thing. So clearly that's not going to be posted anywhere. But, you know, I may do that this month to celebrate Juvenile Arthritis Awareness Month. And I will at least brush my hair. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's it's tough. And, I, and I, I'm like actively practicing acceptance. You know, and I, I I have the, my initial reaction and I have body dysmorphia and other, like I'm a, in recovery from an eating disorder and all this other, you know, issues with my appearance. But, you know, I, I, I there's the shock of you know, like the way I look and then there's just, okay, that's the way I look. People love me. I'm a great person. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a talented writer. I'm funny. And that is just the way I look. And that is just the way things are and get over yourself. So in my experience, first of all, I a little bit have a, a bit of a no shame gene, <laughs> I have a bit well, of a for you. Everyone, you can, look at me. You like can market that. Yeah. I would love well, to get a no, look. No, but but it's it is more complex than that because I do have the same vanity that a lot yeah. of people have. You know, yeah. I'm like, oh god, like I've I've posed it, and it's almost like exposure therapy now that you know that I've been doing the videos for so so long that I'm now it's like I'm adjusted to what I look like. But in the very beginning, yeah. I would like take screenshots and send them to my husband, be like do I look like that when I talk? Like, (laughs) yeah, I have that same, like I would be out at a party and really feeling comfortable and present and enjoying myself. And then I would see the pictures later. And it was just like, there was such a disconnect between how I felt and how I looked. But of course I'm seeing that through the filter of my body dysmorphia and my, you know, lack of self-acceptance. The other thing that dawned on me is that my friends who are around me all the time, they see me a lot more than I see myself. They see my hands more than I see my hands. Cause when you're making a meal or doing whatever you're, you're looking at what you're doing, you're not looking at your hands. So they're actually more desensitized to my deformities than I am. So, you know, if I, if I was one of those woo hippies, I would, you know, stare in the mirror at my hands and tell, tell myself how much I accept and love how I look, but I'm not one of those. <laughs> I'm like, thing. Okay. do not make me do that. I will not do that. I do not. No, I think that that's like, try not to think of white elephants. Like the more you try to make yourself think or not think something, the more you want to think about it. I think my therapist has drilled to me that it took me a very long time to understand in, in, in the framework of acceptance and commitment therapy, also known as ACT, which is like my favorite therapy, mental health therapy modality, acceptance doesn't mean le- like when we talk about acceptance in general, there's like a positive connotation. Like I accept this, I'm at peace, I'm happy with yeah. it. But in in true acceptance in the, in the context of like a mindfulness-based therapy is literally allowing and, and, uh, allowing whatever is present and, and yeah. not running away from it. it doesn't mean that you have to like it, you know? So I yeah, allow that's, this. That's a big key. Yeah. You can accept something without being particularly happy. About it. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, it, it really unburdened, at least for me, it's, it's such a relief. Like it takes a huge burden off to say like, I mean, I don't like that I have rheumatoid arthritis, you know, I wish I didn't have it. And I, but I accept that this is my reality, you yeah. know, but it doesn't mean that I'm like 
I'm, I'm super, super happy that I have it. No, but I'm going to, you know, I'm still kind of happy. Go lucky. Um, I know that you wanted to talk more about the book and I know we're getting, we're getting, um, you know, (laughs) but this is a good topic for the arthritis life podcast. This is good. No. Yeah. I uh, Kathy's together. Watch out. Right. I know. No, no, no. Okay. So I'm scrolling through. Yeah. Um, Oh, I, okay. This is so good. Okay. No, I'm going to do is it, do you think we have time for two more quotes? Sure. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, you, I, I read this like a year ago, but I was like, oh, I love it so much. Okay. He says, you can't blame me for wondering what's going on with you. End quote. I'm in pain all the time, everywhere. That's what's going on with me. When I still don't respond, he says, I have a theory. I'm not a vampire. I say back, making a lame twilight joke. <laughs> he laughs and I even laugh a little. Uh, believe me, you'd never guess. So just tell me then. The last time I told my friends, they all abandoned me. I can't risk that again, but I do risk it. I have arthritis and no, I'm not joking. It's called juvenile arthritis. Even babies can get it. And four months ago, I got it. So now you know. I wait for him to laugh anyway, like Crush Boy did, or to be grossed out or disappointed at how mundane the truth is but he doesn't do any of that. Instead, he says, that's actually what I thought it was. Polyarticular, right? Since it affects five or more joints. And I just want to kill him. (laughs) I'm not even sure why. I grab a backpack and get to my feet. They burn like hell, but I don't care. What did you do with my coat? I snap at him. What? I thought you were staying for dinner. Just tell me where my fucking coat is. He said, she said, Okay. End scene. I'm sorry. This is so you're going to have to all just read this because this doesn't probably make sense how I'm, re- how I'm reading it out loud. But I am. Um, I just, I think that that delicateness, is that a word? <laughs> how delicate it is to, to approach telling a friend, much less a, a new friend or maybe a love interest telling them about your condition is so delicate and so hard. Um, I don't know. Do you want to share any thoughts on that? Well, I know that when I, when I was in high school, you know, I was diagnosed 13, I was miserable. Things got a little bit more regulated, but I was still, I would still limp and, you know, I was still in a lot of pain, Um, but I could sort of pass and I could maybe say, oh, I twisted my ankle, you know, like, so for um, other than my closest friends, and I was a real loner anyway, so I didn't really have it like a circle. I would not disclose, Um, you know, I'd brush it off or I'd say it's some, some other thing. And then, um, because in, in, when I was first diagnosed in eighth grade, like people were just, you know, they, they didn't, they just thought it was so stupid that I had arthritis and it's dumb and you're weird. And, it, you know, so I went to a new high school and I was like, well, I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, and then I remember my first really close gal pal in high school who I'm still friends with today. Uh, she was the first one who like, I would crash at her house and she'd say, did you take your aspirin? And she would call it, you know, you know, my arthritis. Like she, she, in, like she was totally in, in, in on everything. And she would make sure that I didn't fall asleep without taking medicine. And just, she was, so she was the first person that I really completely, um, you know, opened up about all of it too. Um, but by the time I went to college and I was quite disabled, it was before my hip replacement. So it was really um, pronounced uh, Jen Dellenberg, for those that don't know. Um, and I remember coming out of a class and I could no longer pass. That's something like I don't have an invisible disability. I'm like straight up in your face disabled. Nobody glares at me for parking in the blue spot. Um, I remember leaving a class and chatting with someone I just knew from the class but didn't know well. And she said, you know, what to, what's your disability? And I said, oh, well, I have arthritis. And she did laugh because what she was seeing is not what people think of when they think of arthritis. And I was like, yeah, um, you know, and I didn't, I wasn't offended by it. I, she didn't, she didn't, she was like, she thought I was making a joke, like this severe disability you're looking at. Oh, it's just water experience for arthritis. And I said, no, actually it, it, it is actually arthritis. And she's like, wow, I had no idea. So um, I don't have the luxury of, of not disclosing unless I guess I'm on, you know, I'm not on any like dating apps or, or you know, mm-hmm. if I don't, if somebody, if somebody sees me, they know I'm disabled. There's no, there's no hiding it. And in a way that sometimes it's a little easier. So. Well, it, it's like, you don't have to worry about, well, I, I'm guessing you don't have to worry about people questioning 
are you really are you sick enough yeah. are you really nobody accuses me of faking it let's put it that way yeah, yeah. It's the one you know a couple of things i don't have to worry about is that and getting glared at it uh, for parking and handicaps spots. yeah this is a good segue actually to talk a little bit more about um disability rights and disability acceptance or um, i'm not sure what the the phrase that you would use is but I want pride. disability pride that's it yes so yeah can you tell a little bit of the audience a little bit more what that means to you and how you've done that well you know i i look at other pride um movements um the, the gay pride there's the women's live there's you know say it loud i'm black and i'm proud i mean the uh, these other marginalized or underrepresented or or you know um groups that had to rise up and not apologize for their existence, but say, this is my unique and beautiful self and you will give me the rights that I am that I deserve under the law. And we may not change your hearts, but we're gonna change the laws. And I never, I, we're just beginning to see that in, in the disability community. Um, before it was like, oh, I'm a person with a disability. It's at the end of the sentence, I'm a person. And it's like, why do you have to assert that you're a person? And of course you're like, so I really was not um, down with how they were handling it in the beginning, but now it's really starting to come around. And I'm on this um, committee at the Writers Guild of America that forever was called the Writers with Disabilities Committee. And every other uh, equity and inclusion committee was like the Black Writers Committee, the Asian American Writers Committee, the Latinx Writers Committee. And we were like the Writers with Disability literally we were the only one and I had campaigned for so long and you know we had older people that were really like uncomfortable with that um, and then as you know finally we got um, a, a younger chair and, and I proposed it we voted on it you know universally it was just a couple of stragglers so now we are the disabled writers committee um, just like every other committee and um, like I said there is a hashtag say the word movement on Twitter um, and I, you know, I, I had the idea for this shirt way back. I wrote a, I wrote a humorous article for the Philadelphia daily news called I'm lame, I'm game, get used to it. And it was just sort of a humorous article about the different euphemisms, um, and how, uh, you know, I really just prefer disabled. It's not, it's, it's not the negative that you're making it out to be, um, it's a, it's a big part of my personality. It's not the only thing, but, you know, to put it on the end of a sentence or to, or to give me some sort of euphemism, um, you are buying into the ableism that, that has created those things in the first place. One of my favorite ridiculous euphemisms was physically inconvenienced, which is, I just, it's a little snarky and it's just kind of accurate. Yeah. I'm physically, like I said in the article, like if I have to like get my picker upper and I drop that and then I got to get the backup picker upper to pick up the picker upper, I'm a little physically inconvenienced. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's so interesting. I know it's, it's hard for people I, or for many people, I think to have to confront their own internalized ableism, this idea yeah, that well, disability is bad. So if you think like, what would you say to somebody who's like, Ooh, that sounds scary to be like, I'm disabled. Like, well, I really 1000% feel like I, your how you identify is absolutely up to you. And that goes with disability. It goes with all the gender fluidity and, and religion, everything. Like I'm never going to say to someone, you should be identifying as disabled and you're, you're not with the, with the group, you know, you're not, you're not towing the line. So it's very, very individualized. Um, and I would just say, read, read. There are so many articles. Um, there's some linked on my website, carolreedsilverstein.com, Carol with a K. Um, and there, there's any number of wonderful Twitter hashtags and discussions to follow um, where you can just read more about your, you know, signs of your own internal ableism. And, and it's really your choice. And it's, and it's also natural, like, don't feel ashamed um, because we all have it. Even if you're disabled, you have it, you know, because um, we are brought up, we live in a society um, that is constructed in a way that is not uh, suitable for people with mobility issues and um, a society that pokes fun at limps or uh, stutters or needing two hands to pick up a water bottle. I mean, you know, it's like on both sides of the political spectrum, um, people, people were, you know, insulting just having a field day with with Trump's uh, 
you know, it is lack of strength. Or, and I was just like, dude, there are a million things to criticize that guy for, but this one's ableist. So, you know, and then on the other side, oh, Joe Biden stutters. It, it's it's so pervasive. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I totally understand what you're saying. And thank you for, yeah, that clarification about like, I didn't mean, I see my question kind of made it sound like, why should everyone embrace yeah, dis- no, no, yeah, no. being yeah, disabled? No, and that, yeah, the idea that how you identify is up to you, but I think there can be a, some people could think of a connotation in their mind of like, oh, saying I'm disabled or identifying as disabled means like I'm giving up on this idea that I'm going to fight and I'm going to like conquer and overcome, you know, like that. That's, that's, that's the ableism. Yeah. You know, disability and I, is bad. And just yeah. giving in, giving up to your, you know, acknowledging the reality of your situation is giving up. Yeah. Everybody, you know, people can get there in their own time and maybe they won't get there. And that's fine too. No. And this is probably going to sound like the weirdest analogy, but like, I was literally thinking about this as I went to the dentist earlier today. And I was thinking like, there's so many difficult things in life that we do just accept, right? Having yeah. to, I mean, we don't like them, but we accept yeah. that we have to do it. We have to brush our teeth. We have to go to the dentist, you know? And so, and we don't say like, well, my life is not worthwhile because I have to do these things, you know? Yeah. So it's the same thing with like, like I loved at the end of your book, um, I guess it was, I don't know if it's called the epilogue or just the author's notes when you said that, you know, I wanted to steer clear of having Ricky focus on being cured. The majority of kids diagnosed with arthritis won't go into full remission and must find ways to lead big, beautiful life lives anyway. Cursed is for those kids and others living with chronic illnesses and disabilities, as well as anyone who wants to better understand what it's like living with chronic pain. Like I just was like, mic drop. Yeah. I read that. <laughs> well, probably because mics are heavy. You know, when I do karaoke, I got to use two yeah. hands. I made this graphic for the talk I am doing in another 34 minutes. And oh, it oh, really yes. is about um, the duality of this societal pressure of what we're supposed to be like and and all the, the big, messy feelings we have inside. And I'm so proud of this graphic. Oh, good. I'm so glad. Learning Canva. <gasps> So this oh. is like a reveal of this um, graphic that I made. Like, you like it? I love it. Of course, it's- I did it in red and black to be sort of on brand with Curse. Yeah. So, yeah. I love it. It it's, reminds me of a little bit, like I've seen somewhere, it's like what you don't see, there's what you see and what you don't see. But I love that of like that inner tension between like how we, and it will all, um, is it, a, are you going to give me access to that so I can send? I'll try to link to your account whenever you post it so people can know what we're talking yeah, about. I'm doing it at this book, this book uh, club thing today and tomorrow. So let me, let yeah. me reveal it there. I'm, and somebody yeah. said I should put like my name and whatever. You should, name. you should. And people should give you credit for it. Yeah. That, that way that we, we gaslight ourselves sometimes. Yes. I do it all the time. Are you, re- do you really need that accommodation? Do you really, are you really sick enough? you know, and it's just, it's so, yeah, it's so hard to be able to have that self-compassion and and that hold space for yourself to have two different things. Like I'm experiencing something that really sucks right now. And I can allow myself to also be grateful of the ways in which my life doesn't suck. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Did you want to say anything more? I'm like, I'm interpreting your, I just, um, you know, the, this this there is this pressure to to you know be a good sport yeah. <laughs> and you can be a good sport and also have your feelings so uh, balance in life yeah and in almost every situation there is balance is always the best thing I think I don't I can't think of anything where balance isn't a good thing no um, yeah. Per, oh, thank you. And then, and, and just, just to wrap up, cause I do want to respect your time. <laughs> um, um, is there anything else you wanted to say to anyone or uh, advice for young people with juvenile, what that's now called juvenile idiopathic arthritis? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, listen to your OT. Oh yeah. It's like, of course. <laughs> that was, that was like, I was going to put that plug in and I'll, um, I'll give you my address for the toaster. You're going to send me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, you know, form a partnership with your with your healthcare professionals and allow yourself to have big messy feelings if that's what you're having because um, it is a reasonable res- human response to what you're going through. And then the last thing is, if you're really newly diagnosed, gosh, that first that first year, I mean, just give yourself give yourself a break because it it was so overwhelming for me. 
and um, you have all this physical stuff that you're getting used to this pain and exhaustion, what's going to happen to me and, you know, all this gigantic stuff. And then you have all the emotional stuff of, you know, am I going to be able to live the life that I envisioned? And will people look at me funny and will I, you know, meet the love of my life and get married? Will they, will I not be dateable? You know, am I going to be able to go to college? Like all the, whatever the stuff is for you, this sort of plan that you had for your life is all kind of in flux now and you're not sure. Um, But as Cheryl and I can attest, you can go do whatever it was that you were planning. You just, you need a little accommodation. They take a little longer, but you know, you are able to have, they're even, look at the, the woman, um, Ashley, I forget the last thing we want a Tony. I mean, there yeah. are, there are probably, you can't be uh, an astronaut. I think there are really yeah. uh, physical requirements for being an astronaut. Um, but you know, there's Paralympics. You can be an athlete, you can be a dancer, you know, so just, but just, just breathe and allow yourself to be a mess if that's what you need yeah. to do. Allow yourself to curse and read curse and read cursed. Yes. And Oh, the book drive. That was the thing I didn't yes. want to forget. Can you tell everyone? I'm doing a book drive for the month of July. The paperback is coming out July 20th. And uh, all the information is on my website, carolruthsilverstein.com. And um, people will purchase copies of the paperback through my local uh, indie bookstore. So you're supporting a local indie bookstore. And at the end of the month, I am um, going to gather the copies and sign them and get them to a really nice local organization called CoChart, which works with kids with um, chronic illnesses and disabilities in their family. And they are going to distribute the free books. One lucky person who participates will get a little cursed swag collection. So it'll be a book, either hardback or paperback, your choice, some cursed swag and a limited edition cursed mug, which are very cool. And I have one left and it's going to go to one lucky participant. That's amazing. I, I will also do a little giveaway on my page too. If, if you, if that would be helpful, that would be, I'm happy to sponsor that however I need to, but that's so great. I mean, I just really recommend people check this out. Um, it's, it's one thing, you know, that I guess my, I, I'm hearing my 11th grade English teacher in my head. She used to really drill on us show, don't tell, you know, and a lot of us with arthritis, we end up having to tell people, Oh, what is it? Oh, it's an autoimmune blah, blah, blah. That causes this. And, but showing someone through a story, like humans learn through stories and your, your story shows the multifaceted experience of, again, the physical pain, the social effects on your friend, on you or relationships. Also all the mental machinations mm-hmm. of dealing with your day. And that was, that was another thing that, that I wanted to do in Curse was I wanted it to be first person present tense so that the reader could slip into her skin and experience life uh, as she experiences. And I, I, you know, I haven't seen that a lot in books, you know, such a visceral experience of someone with chronic pain. So no, no, I exactly agree with you. There's, I haven't read very many. I do need to read the, um, the piano playing one. I haven't finished that one, but the other one is I've, I've had anxiety and and panic attacks before. And when I read John Green's turtles all the way down, that was the first time I had read something that really described what it feels like when I'm having like a panic spiral. I was like, Oh, that's it. <laughs> like, and you know, he does have OCD and, and yes. Yeah. And you know, there is a certain level of authenticity when the author has the lived experience. You know? Yeah. So it, we, we want to see more books by disabled authors about disabled. Well, and yeah, when I looked, I did look into very briefly um, writing my own book for a children's book specifically. And I was shocked. There's a lot of different specialty publishers for like different kinds of diversity, like ethnic diversity. There was hardly anything for disability. I couldn't, I was really surprised by that, but maybe there's been more now that was a few years ago, but yeah, I'm, well, we're getting there. Yeah, we're getting there. We're bringing up the rear is what we're doing. Yeah. (laughs) The last for the final front disability, the final frontier. Yes. Well, thank you. Inclusion frontier. Inclusion frontier. Yeah. Inclusion, (sighs) true inclusion, not like what sort of tokenism inclusion. Platitudes. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of my pet peeves in the school system. Like inclusion is not just throwing people with different needs into a room together. (laughs) Like you have to actually have facilitate a meaningful 
experience. Yeah. Anyway, but thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I've just been enjoying your your Instagram stuff. So it's a, it's an honor. I am honored. Oh my gosh. No, I am honored. And I, w- I will be happily be your cheerleader slash accountability partner for making more videos if you are comfortable. Um, because I have not, I'm not on TikTok at all. And that is one of my like, I just need to get on TikTok and do something small, you know, just yeah. get started. Just do the first one. So, yeah, it is really in, in even like the first time you get trolled, you'll realize, okay, well, people are some, sometimes say stupid things and I survived, you know, that's yeah, good exposure yeah. therapy too. But mostly it's like, it, it is, it's reinforced. It's, there's positive reinforcement when you share yeah. videos and people have a positive response. So yeah. hopefully you'll have that experience too. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.